engineers here at Hopkins are driven by solving real problems, getting their hands around really thorny, complex, difficult, messy, challenging problems that are both engineering problems and in some instances societal problems as well. There's not too many chances you get to build something that's going to go to Pluto. For these one-of-a-kind, first-time missions, they have mass constraints, they have power constraints, they have programmatic constraints. The biggest challenge for New Horizons is getting there in our lifetime. You do that by making it go fast. The lighter something is, the faster it'll go when you push it. And that turns out to be our challenge. How do we pack all this capability into a package that really weighs less than 1,000 pounds? At the Applied Physics Lab, we're doing things that nobody else can do. That's why I came here. Our processes, when, when we get to the clinical arena, it's got to be extremely streamlined because everything is so tight there. And you really have to be very organized, very streamlined, very precise, very repetitive. And things must be rehearsed hundreds and hundreds of times before you ever try to do that on a human patient. From the perspective of the clinician, there is no shame in simplicity. When the clinician gets held up, when the trouble happens, when he or she has doubts, they want us to look at the problem as it is, and they want us to solve just that one itsy bitsy piece. If you just happen to solve two or three small procedures today in a busy operating room, you may as well have saved the day. That's the art of clinical engineering. Imagine if you built a bridge in the same mold as you build a computer. Would you be satisfied to throw away a bridge two years from now? Consumer products are not actually what come together to form the fabric of the society that we all rely on. It's actually the built environment. It's actually those buildings and those bridges and all those things that we just assume as a modern society are there. I work in a small specialized engineering discipline. Uh, mine is cold form steel. It's a, a type of steel uh, structure which is made from very thin steel. Modern computational methods allow you to look at the performance of such a structure and, and design it um, much more efficiently than we could in the past because we can actually predict the mechanics behind it. Now I have a vision, 10 years from now, things are going to be better. And I'm going to look at buildings and I'm going to know that they used a more efficient section, it cost them less money, used less steel. And these are all big important things to me. Biomedical engineering is really founded on expanding engineering principles to biology. How can we take natural materials that are found in the body that have some biological properties that we want and with just a little bit of chemistry convert them into materials that have the properties we need? Early materials were often supposed to be hidden from the body so the body didn't even know that you had something artificial in there. And now, over the past number of years, it's really moved to, well, how can we design material that actually the body will recognize and positively interact with to perform a certain function? How can we regenerate or repair connective tissues such as cartilage? Today, there are a quarter million artificial knee implants performed every year. There, we can target earlier repair and prevent the need for artificial implants. These machines that we build extend human sensory capabilities to push back the frontiers of knowledge, to, to lift the veil of the ocean. We can build robotic vehicles that can go down to the deepest places in the ocean, and they're slowly enabling us to explore the 97% of the ocean floor which human beings haven't seen and haven't explored. I just got back from a trip in June to survey some uh, canyons that were on the continental shelf slope. The science party on board were a group of paleoclimatologists who used those sediment samples to reverse engineer the Earth's climate, spanning back from the last 10,000 years to the last several hundred thousand years. Every time you deploy a vehicle to a site that has not been explored before, it's the new last place on Earth.
It's actually a remarkable idea that we can understand big questions about the universe from sitting here on Earth. We now know that uh, the 23% of the universe is in some unknown form of dark matter, and 73%, the great bulk of the universe, is in this form of something we call dark energy, which we do not understand. So we understand 4% of the universe, and we've got to understand the other 96%. NASA has a program on the books called the Joint Dark Energy Mission, and uh, I'm playing uh, a major role in trying to unravel the mystery of what, what is this dark energy. When electromagnetism was first worked out, Michael Faraday was asked, uh, what, what, what possible use is this? And his, his answer uh, was, I don't know, but someday you'll tax it. Paralysis is caused by a failure of an electrical circuit within the brain and spinal cord. There is so much to it uh, from the patient perspective, and there's so much biology to it from the, from the research perspective. I see patients who are paralyzed. So you're basically three quarters strength. It is the motivation um, because we really need to bring it from the patient into the laboratory with the ultimate goal though of bringing it back to the patient. This is an epic quest. Now over the last 18 months, we've been able to see paralyzed rats get better. After stem cell transplantation, we can get them to walk again. The Holy Grail is really restoration of function in humans. We will see that in our lifetime. I have no doubt of that. So it seems to me Hopkins' mold is to know how to be the bright light and focus it and go. We really want to continue to produce future legions of leaders so that when people meet one of our graduates, they'll be able to look at them and say, you must be from Popkins. I can tell by the way you think. <laughs>